closer look at President Biden's achievements and his challenges. President Biden is in Asia seeking to curb China's growing influence. Providing weapons to Russia is not going to reflect well on North Korea, and they will pay a price for this. The U.S. puts North Korea's Kim Jong-un on notice as he weighs sending weapons to Russia for use against Ukraine. Plus, people are mad because they see the country heading in the wrong direction. People also do not believe that Joe Biden is up to the task. Republicans hammer the president on his age and threaten to impeach him ahead of his son Hunter's expected indictment. Next. This is Washington Week with The Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan for the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic and moderator, Jeffrey Goldberg. Good evening, and welcome to Washington Week. Tonight, President Biden is in India to attend the G20 summit. He is also adding a day of meetings with Vietnamese leaders in Hanoi. It's a trip aimed at strengthening key relationships while countering China's growing influence. Earlier this week, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan warned that North Korea would pay a price if it aids Russia with weapons for its war with Ukraine. Kim Jong-un plans to travel to Russia soon to finalize a weapons sale. Back home, President Biden's re-election efforts are complicated by voters' ongoing concerns about his age and his son Hunter's legal vulnerabilities. A special counsel recently announced he expects to indict Hunter Biden later this month. The president is also facing impeachment threats from some Republicans, though the rationale for such an impeachment inquiry is unclear. There's probably 40 percent of Americans are out there thinking that our president is not only incompetent, uh, but that he's a crook. I think that they have enough there to do the impeachment inquiry. Tonight, we're going to take stock of the Biden presidency so far and look ahead at the challenges he faces. Joining us to discuss this and more, Elizabeth Bumiller is the Washington bureau chief of The New York Times. Frank Four, my colleague at The Atlantic and the author of the new book, The Last Politician, Inside Joe Biden's White House and the Struggle for America's Future. And Nancy Youssef, a national security correspondent for The Wall Street Journal. Frank, first of all, congratulations on this book. Thank you. Um, it's a very exciting and interesting read. And that's the last nice thing I'm going to say. <laughs> but that is a very good, it's a very good book. Uh, and we're very pleased for you. Um, but let's go right at this, um, let's go right at this toughest question. Yeah. Um, you've been following Joe Biden now from the beginning of the presidency. Um, tell us what you know about his physical health and stamina and his mental acuity. So um, these questions are not binary questions. There's an element of subjectivity to them because the nature of aging is such that it happens differently for different people. Uh, but I think one of the assumptions that people tend to make is that there's the sell-by date on a human being. And so the fact that he no longer walks the way that he used to walk or the way that he talks in the way that he doesn't talk the same way that he used to talk doesn't necessarily mean anything about the way that his mind works. And I think but if you... But the energy level is an interesting question, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the mental acuity part, Nikki Haley's talked about giving a mental acuity test for presidents. I'm sure Biden would ace that test. The energy question is a different question because he's going into this campaign and it's going to be conducted in a different way than the 2020 campaign was conducted. He didn't conduct a campaign because of COVID um, stumping through the country. He was able to pick his spots and let Trump essentially hoist himself on his own petard. This is going to be a different election where he has to energetically make the case for his accomplishments and also energetically make the case for his own energy in a way, given the doubts that voters have about That's his That's extremely meta-sounding. Make know. the case for, <laughs> energetically make the case for energy. Elizabeth, how serious 
a challenge is this for his reelection campaign? Well, the problem is, is that it's you hear different things from the White House. You hear on one hand that I'll answer your question in a minute, but you hear on one hand <laughs> that you know he, he's awakened at three in the morning in Asia. This is a true story. Told that the missile has hit Poland. It's a panic goes off in the national security apparatus. He convenes the world leaders. He handles it. You know, this is a story that is true. You know, he was commander in chief. Not too long ago, he was at the White House in the Rose Garden um, talking about his grandchildren, and he s slipped up on the number of them. He got confused about where they lived. And, uh, you know, you see that in public. So you hear two different stories, and both can obviously can be true. But it is a problem because what voters see is what you see in public. And what you see in public is an 80 year old man who has a very stiff gait. You know, who um, who speaks very, very softly. He doesn't project energy, unlike Donald Trump, who um, has a certain bombastic energy. Um, and he, he's he's only three years younger than Biden. So, what voters see is a man who is showing his age. Right. Doesn't help him. Nancy, I want you to just jump in on on this because um, you have a unique view as a as a foreign correspondent, somebody who's traveled with presidents overseas. Those trips can be. Really, really tough. Uh, I mean, not only the the time zone change and everything else, but unrelenting schedule. You're watching uh, President Biden from afar on this trip, but you've seen him up close. Can you give your own assessment of how he does in these really, really difficult circumstances? Well, I think it's fair to say that um, those trips are indeed grueling. We're talking about going from country to country, uh, maybe five countries in five days, and there's been um, no evidence of um, publicly, at least, of him really. Struggling um, physically, but having said that, I think we're seeing we see often um, events start after 10 a.m. We see um, different pacings of schedules than maybe some previous presidents, and so each president is allowed to set their own tone in terms of how um, aggressively they hold meetings, how often they hold them. But I think um, you, you see some signs of someone who might not have been moving as quickly or as um, as Obama. But also, we haven't seen as many foreign trips, I think, um, by this president than some of his predecessors. And so I think there's been a real um, selective um, process in, in picking how they want to travel, and at the same time, um, signaling that the U.S. is um, a world leader again. So how you strike that balance of sort of meeting the needs of the president and what his phys the physical demands of those trips, and at the same time, being able to successfully say this this administration is committed to reestablishing the U.S. presence on the world stage. Right, right. Frank. Um You've not only studied President Biden closely, but in, in your book, you've obviously spent a, a lot of time talking to Democrats about this, yeah. this presidency. You think in six or nine months, Democrats are going to regret not, not having had a primary? Well, I think one reason that Democrats have not jumped to the stage question is because they like Joe Biden. Personally, they like Joe Biden. I think that he's delivered on so much of their agenda. But a lot of Democrats, rank and file Democrats, have yeah. said they they've said they see the age as a concern. Right. And well, this is the issue is that, that Biden has so struggled to sell his accomplishments, to connect with the base in any sort of meaningful way. There's no there, there isn't the same sort of visceral love for Joe Biden among rank and file Democratic voters in the same sort of way that it existed maybe for Clinton and Obama. Right. But so the question is, like, so the poll numbers for Biden, the recent poll numbers for Biden haven't been great. And the danger is that we are sleepwalking into some sort of version, a repeat version of the 2016 election where Republicans have a very clear line of attack and are able to define Biden in a way that sticks not just with Republican voters, but with independents. And but there's, there's something unreal about that because Right now, the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party is facing 91 felony counts and was twice impeached. I mean, I mean, it seems almost a bit. Uh, on the one hand, you have somebody who's showing some visible signs of age, and on the other hand, you have a guy who might be a convicted felon. I think it's it's incumbent. We're we're dealing with these split screen things where you have the Hunter Biden trial happening alongside Trump's indictments. You have questions about age being raised at the same time that you have uh, all these questions about Donald Trump's own mental stability that perpetually are being raised. And I think it's incumbent upon media and also the Biden campaign to be able to explain the relative difference between these two things, because they simply don't 
exist on the same plane. Whatever Hunter Biden did is a fraction of what Donald Trump has done to democracy or the criminal abuses that are alleged against him, whatever his, yeah. And, and noting just, uh, I want to hear you in one second, Elizabeth, on this question, but noting, uh, this is a very important thing to say, Hunter Biden's not running for anything. Hunter Biden himself is not running for office. He's not in government. And and that's that's one of the, the dissonant points here. But, Elizabeth... There's no parallel whatsoever, as Frank just said. But I, in, those, in those polls where people say they're concerned about the president's age, do they say they're not going to vote for him because he's old? I don't think, you know, you can be concerned about the president's age, but you can still vote for him, especially if your choice is going to be... Um, a man facing 91 felony counts. So I think that, and also the polls are, it's very early. Those are, um, those are head to head matchups of registered voters, not likely voters. We all know that, we all know the caveats here. Yeah. It's far, you know, they're, they're not, yeah, I know. And, and, and no, I was also going to say in, in the economy, it's is, doing it, super yes. well. And, but unfortunately for the Democrats in the White House, they don't seem to know. Voters don't seem to know that. Well, Elizabeth, let me read you something yeah. uh, by, from David Brooks just this week. <clears throat> Quote, Bidenomics is working big time. President Biden promised to help America outcompete authoritarian China and to heal some of the economic divides at home. Both those goals are being achieved. Right. Uh, so what's what, what? Why can't this White House uh, that get is, that message That is out? a very good question. There was a, uh, that was an excellent column by David Brooks this morning. There was also one by Paul Krugman making the point that the economy is doing pretty well. There so far there hasn't been the recession everybody was predicting, and people actually say in polls, which Krugman cites, that uh, they're doing really well. It's just that the economy is terrible. You know, so this makes no sense. But it seems to me that the, uh, you know. It's just odd, uh, and I think Biden is out there talking every day about the economy, but um, it, it just doesn't seem to be sinking in at this point. I, I, I want to turn to Biden on the global stage in, in, in one minute, but, Frank, is there a chance that he may decide not to run? I think that you've—I think that what would it take for him not to, to, get, to get to that point? I think there would have to be like, many, many consistent polls that showed him losing to Donald Trump by— margins that are far greater than the ones that we're seeing. You, there would have to be pressure on him from outside. I think you've seen a lot of pressure from media this week that has kind of started to take the polling question and start to really pound Biden on this. And I think that that could, um, that could, that could sink down, trickle down into um, a broader sense of party panic. But that's the only scenario that I could imagine where it wouldn't happen. Right. <clears throat> Nancy, you study Biden on the world stage very carefully. Give us your overview. Uh, biggest success on the world stage, biggest failure, or biggest challenge? Well, remember when he came into the administration, he had said that he was going to be doing a couple major things. He was going to do democracy promotion in the face. He sort of presented the world as democracies versus autocracies, and that the United States would be the face of democracy. That would go back to uh, uh, honoring its agreements after, under the Trump administration, the United States left the Iran nuclear deal. Um, he also said that he would promote things like human rights and the environment. The, I think if we're picking sort of the biggest success by the own administration's measure, it would be Ukraine. This is the biggest war on Europe since 1945. I don't think at the beginning of the war that people would have anticipated that you would have a coalition that would give nearly $70 billion in military aid across Europe, that you would see a NATO alliance this strong. Even as the war has had some setbacks, the, the willingness of the, the coalition to come together and make these kinds of contributions um, to deter these, these kinds of attacks on Europe, I think the administration point to is one of its great successes. Right. Um, in terms of challenges, I think the biggest one would be Afghanistan and the way the U.S. left. While I think Americans supported the end of that war, the way it happened, the images of Afghans holding on to those C-17s as they took off, I think, is one that will be a part of this uh, administration's history, whatever happens on the world stage. And the fact that after 20 years, the promise of not having a, a, a country that could be a potential safe haven for terrorists, it did that did not pan out. You've got a Taliban back in control. They promised to be more moderate. They have not been. Women aren't able to go to school. We're seeing the return of the very um, people that the United States had targeted for 20 years. And so, um, to me, those are, if you had to assign a big 
biggest success, biggest failure. That's where that's where I would put it. Right. Frank, you have uh, in this book, you have an excellent chapter, fascinating chapter, uh, uh, a lot of coverage of Afghanistan. Uh, President Biden was hell bent on getting out. Can you explain? that desire, and can you explain the consequences of that? Yeah, so one of the interesting things about Joe Biden is that he's somebody who comes, who's been in Washington so long, he's genuinely part of the elite, but he always thinks of himself as an outsider. And his relationship to the foreign policy elite, what Ben Rhodes termed the blob, is a very conflicted one. He wants their approval, but also thinks that he's in some ways smarter than them and views them as lazy. And so Afghanistan was this classic instance for him where he thought the establishment was locked into this war and they just couldn't get out. And so he was determined to find a way out. And he was building on the lessons of the Obama administration where he felt like Obama had been jammed by his generals. And he was determined to not let that happen. So he structured the process for getting out of Afghanistan in order to overcome whatever bureaucratic obstacles, whatever obstacles the military might have put up in his way in order to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, uh, Afghanistan, big problem for Joe Biden electorally? I don't think so. But I, yeah, I, I don't think it's an issue with voters. I don't particularly think Ukraine is an issue with voters. And it's, it's an issue with Republicans and on the Hill about the money being spent. But I don't think it resonates. I really do think it's the economy that's going to be the—and and abortion is going to be a factor climate, climate change. On Afghanistan, I just remember that I used to cover the military with Nancy, but I still remember the generals went in to see Biden very late in the game, begging him to delay the withdrawal. And he just, they went over repeat. Well, you know this, I'm sure. They went over repeatedly, and he just said no, as, you know, well, yeah. absolutely against it. Well, what's interesting is that they, the administration was really adamant about getting out, but in those final months, there was such an overestimation of the right. government in Kabul. You kept hearing Kabul wasn't going to fall, even as every province around them fell and fell rapidly. And I think um, when people are crit critiquing the administration on its handling in Afghanistan, it's because there, there wasn't a plan to get out, that, the, that there was an expectation that, that, despite all evidence to the contrary, that this military, this government was going to be able to hold. And, and in fact, what happened, the president fled the day the, the capital came under attack. And so I think reconciling, if the president was so adamant about getting out, which is an understandable yeah. um, sentiment, why not demand the military planning required to do so in a, in a safer way? Right. Well, the issue was just that the, the, the military's understanding was that at the very end of the occupate, at the, at the very end of our presence in Afghanistan, they would be at their most vulnerable, and so they were determined to just make it happen as quickly as possible. The State Department was making a very different argument about the need to stay, and I think that there was a little bit of working at cross purposes there. And in the end, the intelligence agencies didn't predict that Ghani would collapse as quickly as Ghani collapsed. That was collapsed. the president who fled. Yeah. 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 And, and right. The, uh, Nancy, one more question on this. Um, between now and the election, is there anything on the world stage in national security that you think could affect the outcome of this election? What, what are you looking at in terms of possible threats on the horizon for the U.S. and for our stability? Well, I think in terms of things that voters will be watching uh, as much as foreign policy comes up is what happens in Ukraine. I think uh, there are some who tie the amount of aid that the United States has provided as um, high and are wondering, is it going to lead to real gains and stability in the region, or are we starting um, a potential um, period of instability vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Um, you're hearing some say that we sh that money should be invested domestically. And so I think the outcome of that that conflict, that war, and how the Ukrainians are able to fight, how much the U.S. is able to support them is something that um, that I think voters are going to be watching for. In terms of threats, I think it's um, instability from the Asia-Pacific. We have heard about um, um, t possible um, moves by China towards Taiwan, possible instability in the Asia-Pacific, and how the United States military is able to respond to it, how they're able to sort of quell those concerns um, about threats from the Asia-Pacific. Well, is Kim Jong-un coming back on the world stage in a pretty big way. Exactly. I mean, just this week, and this is a story the New York Times broke, this idea of a Putin-Kim meeting, that part of, I think, one of the, that people are so nervous about it is that we're now talking about these two um, leaders who don't seem to have friends trying to create a new sort of world order built on a shared feeling that they're both 
they, their shared enemy is the United States. And so are they able to sort of galvanize um, an alliance that actually not only keeps the war in Ukraine going, but potentially gives um, North Korea the military technology to to build up its nuclear weapons program? But very, very nice crediting of the New York Times, Thank by the you. way. <laughs> I, I feel like we're at Camp David at a, at a peace process. <laughs> Go ahead. One of the interesting things about uh, Putin turning to North Korea is that it in some ways represents a failure because yes. he was desperate to get the Chinese on board. And I, I have a story in my book about during the first days of the Ukraine war, we had this intelligence. New York Times reported this at the time that that uh, the China was considering arming Ukraine, uh, the Russians. And uh, Biden ends up getting a video conference with Xi that very week and basically implores him not to do it and tells him that there will be enormous consequences. And he's able to do it in a way that mattered to China, that he, would, he was predicting that American business would flee China. We can't do that with North Korea. North Korea doesn't, is not a country that is enmeshed in global capitalism. So there's very little to stop them from uh, forming this alliance. Right. Nice, nice crediting of it. It's fine when the Wall Street Journal credits. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't think the Atlantic no. has to go there, by the way. But Frank, let me let me uh, let me let me ask you. Let me bring it back to um, to Biden and his and his presidency and the yeah. domestic. You you wrote something that's so interesting in this book. You said, "quote The consistent underestimation of Joe Biden was his diesel." Uh, we're having all of these conversations about Biden and extremists, the impact of the Hunter Biden issue, the economy, people not recognizing what he's done in the economy. But the man's been underestimated for yeah. a very long time. Talk about that a yeah, little bit. Yeah, so I think part of his political wisdom and part of his stubborn determination is that he can hear conversations like the one we're having tonight and he can say, you know what, I'm not backing off my course. This happened in the midterm elections. He wanted to make the midterm elections entirely about American democracy and to make this a binary choice between him, the Democrats and the Republicans, but not a referendum on the Biden presidency. And everybody mocked him. They said, you got to speak to inflation. You got to speak to crime. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And you know, lo and behold, despite the expectations, the Democrats were able to overperform in the 22 uh, midterm elections. Right. Elizabeth, Jim Messina told Politico, Jim Messina, Democratic yes, yes. Uh, strategist, he, he said that the Democrats need to stop acting as, quote, bedwetters. Yes. His word, not mine. But is he on to something? Is there like a, a panic that you're noticing yeah, across yeah, there's a, there's, Democratic there's circles? There's always a panic in the Democratic circles. When was there not? But uh, remember, like when Biden, well, there wasn't a panic about Biden, but Biden was supposed to lose the primaries, right? Yeah. It was only he, he, you know, he was completely, well, you know, written off. But yes, there's always a panic among Democrats. Um, Democrats are warriors. Um, they need to be warriors, as people say, but, you know, they just, they just fret. And I think that um, if you look Look at what Biden has accomplished or what the administration has accomplished. It's pretty extraordinary. And people just aren't aware of it. I mean, the, I will go we know what they are, the Infrastructure Act, all this thing that, that Trump never got done. You know, it got, Biden got it done all over the country. In the next 10 years, there will be huge billions of dollars spent on roads and bridges and, your, you know, in local communities. People probably won't know that's the Biden administration. Right. You know, pouring all that money into um, COVID relief, you know, it just, um, and now, so, um, it's a problem. People don't understand it. Right. Go ahead. I was just going to say, what I think is interesting is that you're describing that a lot of the things that Biden's been able to do is because he's been in the job and survived for decades. That is the very thing, his age and experience, yes, yes. that is, is arguably fueling his success and now might be um, of the liability in this election. It's an interesting irony of sorts. Nancy, I, I want to ask you this, because uh, you and I are both tracking this issue, and it, and it reflects directly back onto Joe Biden's difficulties. Senator Tuberville has held the nominations of now hundreds of uh, generals, or promotions of hundreds of generals. That's right. There's no precedent for this in American history of a senator doing that. Talk about that in the context of the challenges Joe Biden faces on national security. Well, it's interesting because it, we've now entered six months of these holds, 300. The U.S. military is predicting maybe 800. I think uh, earlier on you heard the uh, Pentagon talk about this as a military readiness issue. This week we saw the service chiefs coming out publicly more aggressively, I think, because the um, Congress was back in session. And what they're saying is that this is going to have 
immeasurable effects that 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 will erode the military over time. We talk so often about the generals that aren't getting promoted, but what they what we heard from the service secretaries is what about the majors and the lieutenant colonels who are doing two jobs and watching the generation ahead of them not be able to move, not be able to get promoted, and asking themselves, do I really want to stay in the military? And I think that's the long-term effect we could see in national security. Right, right. You know, it's uh, that's a fascinating issue and one that we should track. I'm sorry that um, we're running out of time. I could listen to you all all night, as I'm sure our viewers could. Um, I want to congratulate uh, Frank for on this book. When you have your next books, um, come on, and I will hold them up just like I'm holding this up. And um, I want to thank all of you for coming and for sharing all of your reporting. Thank all of you for joining us. Um, be sure to tune into PBS News Weekend on Saturday for a look at a report, a new report that reveals the enormous cost of invasive species. I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with the Atlantic is provided by Consumer Cellular. This is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.